Um, so the subject matter I wanted to speak about today is quite far away in time and space from John's work on prehistoric Balkans. But I was drawn to the session because the meaningful fragment fragmentation of objects and bodies resonates so strongly with medieval evidence, in particular in relation to Christian relics and reliquaries. Because we don't have to work too hard to demonstrate that fragmentation in this medieval Christian context was meaningful in linking people, places and communities, there have been fewer attempts to a combine uh, interpretation with a theoretical underpinning than you might suppose. I'd like to look today at whether fragmentation and enchainment might draw out more meaning in these early medieval contexts, and perhaps whether in turn fragmentation lens might be slightly enriched in the process. So my focus today is uh, an object that's now in the collection of National Museums Scotland uh, that's known as the Moni Musk Reliquary. This is a casket that first emerged into scholarly consciousness in the 19th century and has traditionally been dated to the 8th century AD. Nothing's firmly known about the thousand or so years in between those two dates. It's usually attributed to Scotland, but other similar boxes have been identified as Irish. And in fact, uh, the hybridised art style at this period means it's difficult or nigh on impossible to tell. The object's uh, term title today includes the term reliquary. Um, but in actual fact, Money Musk is empty, as you can see in the top photo. And there are no textual accounts of its former contents. It might have been a reliquary, or it might have been a container for other sorts of holy substances, so chrismal, uh, oil, or the Eucharist, perhaps. For the first 130 years after Moni Musk became known to scholars, writers emphasised how odd it was for such a Christian object to carry no overt Christian symbolism. This changed in the 1980s when um, our predecessor at the museum, RBK Stevenson, uh, first noted that there was a cross hidden uh, within the interlaced strands uh, in the bottom left image on the, the roof bar of the, of the reliquary. The voids between the interlaced strands here can be seen as forming an equal armed cross. And I'm going to return to that later because it was a, a hugely perceptive observation that was well ahead of its time. So it's one of a group of house-shaped, uh, similar so-called house-shaped shrines that survive in church and museum collections across Europe, uh, in Ireland, Italy and Scandinavia today. Several of them today contain relics, but it's not at all certain that these belong to their early medieval parts of their lives. They've all had long lives. Some of those relics, for instance, uh, have uh, 16th or 17th century wrappings and labels. Uh, the size of the caskets mean that they might have contained slivers, scraps and fragments, but probably not whole anythings. Two of the shrines in Italian collections have links to a specific Irish cleric, Columbanus, who travelled to the continent and established the monastery at Bobbio. It's, oh, it's been suggested that either an insular metal worker travelled to Bobbio and made those shrines, or that complete examples were sent from Ireland. And I just give that piece of information because it's indicative of the kinds of personal and institutional relationships that we know were involved in the making and movement of these whole portable reliquaries. Uh, so, though common to most of the Christian past, the meanings, uses, powers and contexts of relics and reliquaries changed over the medieval period. The bit that I'm going to focus on is broadly the 7th to 12th centuries in the insular world, so by that I mean Scotland and Ireland, primarily. Um, at their most simple, relics can be summed up physically as many small, different, easily portable material substances, some organic, some inorganic, uh, which had been removed from their place of origin and carried elsewhere and that screams in chained fragments. Many are fragments of larger holes, and thanks to context and text, we can sometimes recognize those for what they were. So the motivation for the fragmentation of relics, there are some relics, um, are, are fairly well established. So relics were conceived of as divine, powerful, miraculous objects that could bring or legitimize power or status to their institutional, and in some contexts, pri uh, private owners. So the establishment of new church foundations required them, but also uh, becoming a major site of pil pilgrimage brought status and material advantages for those foundations with uh, large collections of relics. Fragme fragmenting existing holy objects is one means of satisfying this demand for, uh, for relics in the early medieval period. Um, but contact relics, whereby something gained sanctity by touching something else that was holy, uh, was a much more sustainable alternative, and those were also prone to being broken up. So we've got lots of relics. 
floating around, many of them fragments. And we kind of understand that, we think. However, in contrast, there's been much less consideration about the fragmentation of reliquaries. And when you think about it, this is a bit odd, because reliquaries held, in all senses of the word, um, the power of their contents. They became holy by association. They could act as transmitters of the power of their contents. They relayed power that would be consumed by eye or by touch uh, by their audiences. And though they are and were very powerful and charged objects, we've tended to view the fragmentation of them really prosaically, for which I blame the Vikings. The Viking Age provides, on the face of it, quite a simple interpretation for the destruction and reworking of reliquary parts as loot. And on the face of it, we do seem to have decent evidence for this. For instance, in repeated um, instances of the reworking of the side plates at the sides of these reliquary shrines, shrines into brooches, uh, for example, from Carnivarach from Scotland, uh, which is on this slide, and from a range of uh, burials in uh, Norway. Uh, those have been argued to represent um, households' investment, I suppose, in overseas expeditions. But there are quite a lot of unmodified, fragmented shrine component found in archaeological contexts. And I think that this should give us pause for thought. Because viewed from Chapman's perspective, it's possible to conceive of these fragments as products of deliberate breaking and redistribution of reliquaries within Christian contexts, i.e. they're broken up, but they still retain their holiness. They might still be in chain fragments. It's possible that some lived lives out in the wild as enchained fragments, carrying significance into individuals' lives and homes, uh, kind of like pil pilgrim souvenirs, I suppose. But another possibility um, is that fragments circulated within, within more closed ecclesiastical networks. And I think this is more likely for what I want to propose for Money Musk. Crumbs. Um, though usually thought about as one thing, uh, Money Musk is a composite object made up of many separate pieces. Excluding all the pins that hold it together, it's made up of 41 surviving components, together with at least another 15 that have been lost. So putting its composite nature um, front and centre allows for more scope to think about its disparate components uh, coming together and coming apart than has been attempted before. Now that provides uh, uh, ample opportunity for making, remaking and alteration. And the clearest place that this is visible is on the front of the reliquary in the applied mounts. So we've got circular mounts and we've got rectangular mounts. The circular, the, both types are superficially similar, but they're made in different ways. So the circular ones are composite themselves. They're made of a cut down interlaced decorated plate to which a separate frame has been added. And I hope you can see just on the edge um, there's a little cutaway portion that relates to its trimming down. The rectangular mounts, on the other hand, are cast as a single piece to match the in-framed circular plates. Their decoration, though superficially similar, is different as well. So we've got proper interlace, true interlace on the circular plates, and that matches um, the interlace that's on the roof bar on top of the reliquary. But the rectangular mounts have discontinuous threads. And in early medieval terms, that's mega. Like the difference between interlace and just lying some lines over the top is really significant. XRF analysis also confirms this distinction is reflected in their alloys too. So we've got two phases at least here. The silver plates and the wooden box have both been treated differently to accommodate those two sets of mounts. Um, and it's a bit too complicated to go into uh, there, but it suggests that different adaptation was required uh, to accommodate the newly made rectangular mounts and the reframed circular ones. So I've had to rattle through what is actually a much more complicated picture in terms of phasing. But the sum up is that Money Mask appears to preserve the memory elaborated and remade of an earlier decorative scheme featuring three circular interlace unframed decorated mounts and an interlace decorated roof beam. Uh, I've greyed the rest out here so that you can just see those three uh, mounts on the top bit that I'm proposing are, are early elements. Now, this arrangement shouldn't in fact be surprising given actually when you think about it, most of the other shrines like this also have three mounts on the front, not six. Uh, six is quite unusual, and actually when you look at it, the others with six on the front also have good evidence for phasing. I think they've also been reworked. I think if we'd thought about it, we'd have seen that there's a, a more normal insular shrine hiding in plain sight here, masked by later additions. 
Both sets of mounts, my early and later mounts, carry um, symbolically charged decoration and all are worn, suggesting that they were all focal points for veneration by touch. Um, my reading with the, of the layers within Money Musk suggests that an earlier reliquary, and it is a reliquary, I think, rather than um, parts of brooches, for instance, for reasons I don't have time to go into, uh, was fragmented with elements then reincorporated reincorporated knowingly, carrying their enchained relationships with them to create the reliquary we see today. Now, this certainly fits really well with other evidence for modification of insular reliquaries. Um, increasingly, in the last uh, few decades, there's been really good cases made for meaningful alteration of reliquaries with pieces added to uh, linked to circumstances that we know about in historical documents. For instance, changes in ecclesiastical control, they, uh, they mark that uh, through uh, additions to the reliquary. In some ways, they back project change, they justify and legitimate change that uh, administrative changes. In Monimus, we don't know enough about its history to know, to be able to link this fragmentation to specific historical circumstances. We can't recover the specifics of the enchained relationships that I think are going on here, but we might be able to read something into the symbolism that's being created from these different pieces. So the capacity for subtle, hidden, symbolic meaning within early Christian art is massive. Multivalency, so multiple meanings was key and texts help us here. They give us examples where people, uh, early Christian thinkers, were expressly um, articulating the desire to seek hidden meanings, to, to ruminate, to, to find new connections between image and, and words. The reused three secular mounts emphasize the number three, and in a Christian context, that's the Trinity. Uh, or some of the other sets of three mounts also feature triscale, three-part uh, motifs, and all of them are arranged in a triangle, which was becoming a Trinitarian symbol. Uh, that you can see other evidence for that in things like the Book of Durrow and the Book of Kells. But at some point, this second layer was added to uh, Money Musk symbolism. The rectangular form of the mounts uh, alludes, lends itself to allusions to the cross. Um, I perhaps won't go into all the reasons why, but there's lots of uh, tiny elements um, which we can really clearly pick out with uh, uh, analogies to other media of early Christian art that emphasise cross, uh, four-pointed knots, uh, lozenges as, as the symbol of, of Christ. When you read the placement of the mounts together with the uh, central interlaced panel on the top of the roof, which is where that wee secret hidden cross is, you can also see the whole arrangement as a cross. And with the circular mount in the middle, it gives a very Irish or insular ring-headed cross flavour to that arrangement. Some of the Irish high crosses, interestingly, here we've got Murdex cross from Monasterboice, indeed have a mini insular house-shaped shrine sitting on top of the cross. So you can see, I hope, the upper cross arm has a little roof on top. So my reading suggests that the reworking of this reliquary's decorative scheme added allusions to the cross to an earlier emphasis on the Trinity. And in the context of the debate over the function of these boxes, I wonder uh, whether we could link that possibly to a shift in function. So some people have argued reliquaries, some boxes more directly connected to the Eucharist. But regardless, in the context of early medieval multivalent images, it's very likely indeed that these uh, added elements supplemented but didn't overwrite the significance of the earlier enchained uh, uh, mounts in their audience's mind. So my last um, two paragraphs, um, the multivalency of early Christian imagery, I wonder whether it might also provide an alternative perspective on fragmentation. So much as hybridity and entanglement might be physical, whereby you change an object and it, become, it gains new meaning, or it might be social, where an unchanged object gains new meaning through new context, I wonder whether we might consider whether fragmentation, enchained meaningful fragmentation, might be conceptual as well as literal. So the unravelling of layered motifs requires a mental fragmentation, a mental deconstruction of image, and it provides opportunities for multiple simultaneous reconstructions within the mind. This is one of the characteristics of early Christian art. What I'm suggesting is 
is bog standard in terms of our understanding of early Christian art, but we haven't thought about it from an explicitly fragmentation uh, theoretical perspective. The hidden crosses, including that tiny wee one within the spaces of the interlace there, are excellent example. Hiding symbols in the spaces between the threads of interlace is everywhere in early medieval art. As Bel Ben Tillman put it, these um, hidden designs elude notice until one has caught sight of them, after which they proliferate quickly and become so clearly evident that the interlace patterns, the main thing that we first notice, actually recede into the background. So once you see a hidden motif, an alternative way of reading an image, it's really hard to unsee, and I know that from my own work. Fragmentation requires the literal breaking of something to create material links between people, but I wonder whether a shared ethos or a way of seeing that mentally fragments images or objects might also conceivably enable social relationships. It's not so different, as I say, to our traditional kind of instinctive understanding of how this type of early medieval insular art was read. But juxtaposing it with an understanding of literal fragmentation might bring some added benefits to our study, but perhaps also maybe for some of the additional types of fragmentation we see in earlier periods too. I'll stop there. <laughs>